Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us at the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program with speaker Charlotte Wolheim. My name is Julia Thompson, and I'm the Education Program Manager at the Holocaust Center. Yesterday was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, a day in which many of us, including Holocaust Center staff, set aside work or typical obligations to remember MLK's legacy. With our country divided on the eve of a new president's inauguration, Dr. King's goals of racial, social, and economic justice remain extraordinarily salient. The last 75 years since the Holocaust have made it clear that civil rights struggles are a defining feature of modern history. What can each one of us do to ensure that Dr. King's work and wisdom continues? How can episodes like the Holocaust or the racism that led to Dr. King's assassination inform our understanding of bigotry today? These are the kinds of hard questions that the Holocaust Center asks students and all community members to consider. And our work relies heavily on Speakers Bureau members who continually and generously share their memories, insights, and testimony to connect the past to the present. Today, I am pleased to welcome Holocaust Center Speakers Bureau member, Charlotte Wolheim. Charlotte was born in a Jewish family in Aschaffenburg, Germany, and remembers a happy childhood. This began to change when the Nazi party came to power in 1933. As Jews' lives became increasingly threatened, her parents sent Charlotte and her sister to a Jewish orphanage while they try tried to find a way out of Europe. Charlotte's family made it to the United States, but not before her father was arrested multiple times, her home vandalized, and their lives endangered. Charlotte will share more about these experiences today, as well as those from her career in Holocaust education. We will finish with a question and answer session so please add yours to the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'd like to thank our community partners for this week, the Goethe Pop-Up Seattle, and the Holocaust and Jewish Resistance Teachers Program. Thank you also to the Tacoma Jewish Community Fund for sponsoring the 2021 Lunch and Learn series. Our supporters make programs like this possible and you can find out more about becoming a member of the Holocaust Center by visiting our website, holocaustcenterseattle.org today. I will conclude my introduction with the acknowledgement that the Holocaust Center for Humanity here in downtown Seattle sits on the ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. The Duwamish are a people who are still here, continuing to honor and bring to life their ancient heritage. And with that, I will turn it over to Charlotte to begin. I too would like to welcome everyone here. And if Julia is ready, I'm ready to start sharing my story with you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Next, please. I don't, I'm pretty sure that Aschaffenburg, where I was born, is not on this map because it's a really small town in near Frankfurt on the Main River. It's a pretty town. Uh, here are my ancestors. 
on both my mother and father's side. And over here is a picture of my father's mother who lived with us, my Uma. And these two are my cousins. And this is my sister Marion, three years older than I, and this is I. And this, you can see, this is the whole school uh, in Aschaffenburg. And the school not only included children who lived in Aschaffenburg, but those from neighboring farms, at the Jewish school, I should say. By the time I came of school age, Jewish children could no longer attend public school. My sister had started public school, but I never did. We went to school in the rabbi's house. And may I say the discipline was quite strict. Charlotte, uh, would you tell us how old you are in this class photo we see? I imagine I'm about seven or eight because uh, at eight, my parent, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but my parents had planned for us to emigrate to Spain. And when the Spanish Civil War broke out, those plans fell apart. And Marion and I were sent to a, an orphanage, Jewish orphanage in Esslingen, which opened its doors to boarding students when Jews, Jewish children could no longer attend public school. And their school was excellent. We'll get to that more a little bit later. Right. Uh, this synagogue in Aschaffenburg, uh, it, it, to this day, I don't quite understand the architecture because it looks Moorish. It was a large, very beautiful synagogue. And the lower picture uh, is Aschaffenburg as it is today, uh, whatever was destroyed during the war was rebuilt exactly as it had been. And it is a really very scenic town. My, uh, I was born on November 11th, 1928. And by comparison, uh, I will mention her later, uh, Anne Frank, I'm sure you're familiar with her book, was born June 12th in 1929. As I said, I lived with my mother, father, grandmother, and my older sister, Marion. We not only belonged to the synagogue, but my father was the treasurer. He worked uh, as the menswear buyer in the only department store in Aschaffenburg, which was owned by a member of the family. My father had been born with cataract on both eyes. And in this country probably would have been deemed legally blind, but uh, that did not prevent him from being drafted into the army in World War I. His hearing was very acute, which didn't always work out well for me. And uh, he was a radio operator in World War I. I. I always teased him about the Germans losing the war because he had been drafted. As everyone in the audience probably knows, the uh, Germans lost the war. The Treaty of Versailles was signed in June of 1991, uh, 1919, I'm sorry, and a worldwide economic depression ensued. Uh, the situation in Germany was desperate. 
many people unemployed. The German mark was devalued to the point where it was worthless. And of course, there always has to be a villain of the story. And the villains were the social democrats, the communists, and as ever, the Jews. Because of the economic situation, the Nazi party won the majority of seats in the election and Hitler was appointed chancellor on January 30th, 1933. He was granted emergency power through the Enabling Act passed on March 24th, 1933. One of the first official acts was that all German Jews lost their citizenship. And here you see the citizenship uh, papers of my father who was born in Aschaffenburg and my mother whose maiden name was Ostwald and she had been born in Koblenz. My father was the treasurer of our synagogue and the notice came that the funds held by the synagogue were to be confiscated and uh, there was a date on which members, representatives of the Nazi party would come to take the funds in an emergency meeting of the board, it was decided to distribute the funds among the poorest members of the congregation. And then my dad burned the books. On the date, the Nazi representatives came and they demanded the funds when told that there were no funds they asked to see the books. And when those also were not available, my father and the other leaders of the synagogue were arrested. This was in 1936. I don't remember how long my father was incarcerated. One of the difficulties of giving testimony in the 21st century is trying to describe what life was like in the 30s in Germany and also in other countries. There were no cell phones, there was no TV, and uh, my family had a radio, which was absolutely under the auspices of my parents. And whatever news my sister and I got was that which was deemed appropriate by my parents. So a lot of details are missing. When my father was released from jail, he and my mother came to the recognition that Germany was no longer a safe place for Jews. And they determined that my mother and father would go to Spain where my mother's younger sister and her husband lived. Her, my uncle was, started out as a lawyer in Frankfurt he vacationed in Spain and fell in love with Spain. And he also, among uh, his many talents, was quite a linguist and decided to open a law office in Spain. And so my parents decided that uh, my mother and father would go to Spain 
find a new residence for us and then sent for Marion and me. So they sent the furniture to Spain and Marion and I were sent to, <coughs> to Esslingen to, as I described, the orphanage, which now a, a Jewish orphanage, which now also accepted boarding students. The reason my parents chose that particular place is that the head of the orphanage, his, one of his two daughters was my mother's closest friends. The head of the orphanage was Theodore Rothschild. There aren't words enough to describe how extraordinary this man was, aside from being a wonderful educator, he had such a deep understanding and love for children. Uh, when his two daughters married and one with children had emigrated to America some years earlier and were very anxious to have their fa <clears throat> father join them in America. He refused because he did not want to abandon the orphans under his care. Uh, he eventually together with his orphans was deported to Terezin where he died in 1944. I have a quick question, Charlotte. I'm wondering if you ever interacted with Mr. Rothschild when you oh, were in Esslingen? Yes. Uh, I, my closest friend in Esslingen was Billa, and I'm afraid we were not uh, examples of the best kids in the class. And so not infrequently, during the time that other children had recess, Bella and I were assigned to stay in the classroom for having spoken when we shouldn't have. And not quite often, uh, Dr. Rothschild would come by the classroom and peek in and see Bella and me and sort of tongue in cheek he would ask why we were, you know, were we so such studious children that we wanted to spend extra time in the classroom. And we of course had to admit that that was not the reason we were there. And he treated us with love and humor and understanding. I, I think that all of us, the orphans, as well as those of us who were boarding students, respected and loved this man. He was just such a extraordinary, an extraordinary human being. So you remember your time in the orphanage as one of safety rather than fear? Um, were you homesick? I was terribly homesick and it, it really, uh, I think a rather adult understanding uh, was forced on me, namely uh, I sensed that my parents were not in control of what was going on, that circumstances at times presented themselves that left even adults somewhat helpless. And I have to tell one other incident. When we first came to the uh, orphanage, they had a wonderful music program and children were encouraged to learn an instrument. However, at the same time as the musical instrument lessons, those who weren't 
didn't have instruments were in the gymnasium. And the gymnasium had, to my eyes, wonderful equipment that I had never seen before. And it looked like a lot more fun than learning an instrument. So when I was presented with a question of which instrument I would like to learn, I said that my heart was set on learning the accordion. Now the accordion was half my size. I knew that no, there wasn't a chance that I could lift it, let alone learn to play it. So after I presented this woe begone face of disappointment that I couldn't learn the accordion, uh, I was released to go to the gym. Wow, that, that's great. So that was one of my happy experiences at, in Esslingen. It was a, a, an extraordinary school, but I was very homesick. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not only homesick, but there was the sense that thing going on that I didn't understand, but that seemed um, so huge that my parents were not in control. And, and that's very disconcerting. Right. Well, let's move on to the next slide and you can talk about um, what transpired in Spain. My, as said, my parents were set to go to Spain. They sent uh, certain pieces of furniture there. And shortly before their departure, the Spanish Civil War broke out and the borders were closed. So now we were, my parents were in Aschaffenburg Furniture was in Spain. Marion and I were in Esslingen. And where to turn, where to go. This was the same dilemma that Anne Frank's parents faced. She was in, they were in hiding in Holland. And we were for, more fortunate than the Frank family uh, after two years of searching, uh, my mother's cousin agreed to sponsor us. He, uh, as a young man, was quite adventurous and wanted to come go to America and to seek his fortune. And my grandfather gave him the funds that made that possible. So he in turn, uh, as I say, uh, by the time that we, my parents approached him, uh, he was well-to-do and afforded us a affidavit, which by the way, he included my grandfather, but my grandfather who was deaf said he had lived his whole life in Germany. He knew the Germans. And uh, as in previous problems, this would blow over. He too died in Terezin. We were at my grandfather's house in November November 9th of 1938 to say goodbye to him. We were on our way out of Germany and we're fast asleep in the middle of the night when our front door, his front door was crashed open. Whoever, the people who came in went into the kitchen proceeded to take all the dishes out of the cabinets and smash them along with all the glasses. My mother, of course, all of us, except my grandfather who was deaf, 
uh, were awake and, and kind of huddled together. My mother told my sister and me to get dressed and climb out the window and hide in the garden. As soon as these people left, my father dressed to go to the police precinct to report what he believed was the singular act and he didn't come back. The next morning, my mother went out to look for my father and along the way ran into a former classmate in full Nazi regalia, who I guess out of some remembered act of friendship told my mother that no, this had not been a, an act, a singular act of home invasion, but it was happening all over Germany to Jewish homes and shops. Fortunately, my mother had the papers to prove that we were leaving the country. And so my father was released. We took the train back to Aschaffenburg and walking past where the synagogue had stood, there were heaps of smoldering ashes. We were told that uh, members of the fire department had ringed the uh, synagogue to make sure that no cinders would ignite the Gentile homes around there. And in looking at, at the debris, my sister spied the Kiddush cup that belonged to the congregation. Uh, all Jewish holidays, uh, including the Sabbath, are ushered in with a drink of sweet wine asking for a sweet week. My, we, my sister picked up the cup and we took it with us to America. And just as an aside, on her only visit back to Aschaffenburg, she returned the cleaned up cup to the city there are no more Jews in Aschaffenburg. The rabbi's house has been converted into a Jewish museum and the Kiddush cup is one of the few exhibits in it. We, my family uh, took the train to the coast of France, the Southern coast of France where the same aunt and uncle who had lived in Spain had fled because my uncle was warned that he would be arrested by the Franco regime. And he was now practicing law on the Côte d'Azur, the French Riviera in France, he, he, I mean, he was quite amazing. He could practice law in German, Spanish and French. And we visited there with them for a month. The weather was glorious. My two little cousins were adorable, but much to my regret, we couldn't stay there, which in retrospect was a blessing. And we then took the train to La Havre to catch, to get on board the uh, ship that was to take us uh, to America. La Havre is a port that is, the water is not deep enough for large liners to enter the port. You have to take a smaller boat that takes you to the larger boat. It was so stormy that this little boat kept turning around itself before we got to our, 
destination. And that's when my sister's seasickness started. Uh, my mother and I joined her after we got on board because the Atlantic in December is very rough seas. It was a horrible journey. Uh, I remember at one point lifting my head up and telling my mother that I didn't want to go to America. I wanted to die. A bit of a flair for the drama. We landed in New York on Christmas Day, 1938. This is the manifest of the ship that we were on. And I have to say, we were fortunate that we couldn't take money out of Germany. And we had to book passage on a German ship. So we were able to book passage and we were able, my parents were able to spend money to be able to get, I forget, first or second class. And the reason that was important is that the ship stopped in Ellis Island and those in lower classes actually had to get off the ship and were ferried to Ellis Island for their uh, IDs to be checked there. Uh, passengers in first and second class, there were agents, immigration agents who came aboard and they checked us while on board. As I said, we were, I was one of the lucky ones uh, between 33 and 1941, about half of the Jews in Eschenburg immigrated. 121 left for other German cities. God only knows what their fate was. And 170 were deported to Terezin or Theresienstadt in 42, and then eventually to Auschwitz. Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, some of the history of the camps, uh, Terezin or Theresienstadt was the camp that was inspected by the International Red Cross. And the Germans did their utmost to kind of put paint on the pig to uh, convince the members of the Red Cross how humane they were. Charlotte, before we um, talk a little bit more about your adult life, I was wondering if you could um, provide an anecdote or a story about um, first impressions in America and I know you also have a great story about um, yes. a classmate. Yes. Uh, as I said, I was, I turned 10 in November. We landed in America Christmas day of that year. And in as much as I not, neither spoke nor understood a word of English, I was put into a class two years below where others my age would be. Uh, the teacher's name was Mrs. Appel. She's the only one whose name I remember because she lives in my memory and in infamy. She was sorely put upon by having this child foisted on her who didn't understand what was going on. And 
the only one in that class who befriended me was a little African-American girl. I'd never seen an African-American. It was a moment or a, a, an experience whose impression lasted a lifetime as far as humanity, not judging people by their appearance, but by the size of their heart. And it's something I never forgot. We were close friends until the following uh, semester, uh, I learned English by that time. And by the way, uh, I learned English or in great part by doing simple crossword. I, I would get very easy crossword puzzle books and have them in front of me, have one in front of me and a, a dictionary next to me. And I learned meanings, spelling, and it also became an addiction. <laughs> Here I am at 92 and I'm still doing the crossword puzzles. It was a wonderful way to learn the language. Of, of all addictions to have, that's a pretty good one. It, it, yes, I agree. It, uh, particularly, you're very young. When you get to be my age, you realize that very often words are not there at your disposal. But if you're a lifelong crossword puzzle person, chances are you'll have a sin in them. <laughs> and that's really helpful. That's great. So I'm moving, sorry. no, that's fine. Just moving forward and this next slide talks a bit about um, your first marriage. I met my first husband, Henry, on a ski trip. Henry was the only son of a Jewish family from Leipzig. He had two sisters. He was the only survivor of his family. The other four members died in Auschwitz. And as the Russians came closer, uh, I mean, the, the Germans realized that they were beginning to lose the war and they did not want a Jewish uh, uh, concentration camp inmates to be liberated. So they would march them further away from the Russians. And as fate would have it, uh, my husband Henry had been in uh, Auschwitz with the man who became my second husband and also both survived that death march and both fled from the uh, Nazis during a bombardment and thus saved their lives. Uh, we had three sons and unfortunately uh, Henry died young of a form of cancer. He died in 1968, two weeks before our oldest son's bar mitzvah. As I said, uh, 15 years later, I met again Norbert Walheim, who was widowed and he, he was quite a bit older than I. He had been in law school in Berlin and before they could kick him out, he left law school 
and devoted his time to the Jewish community in Berlin. And after Kristallnacht, uh, the British offered to take in a certain number of European Jewish children. They specified the ages that they had to be. And Nobit was put in charge of that program in Berlin. Uh, while he was in camp, uh, along with so many other Jews, uh, IG Farben, a large manufacturing company in Germany, had a, a plant in the vicinity of uh, Buna, which was an auxiliary camp of Auschwitz. And there they had the German, the Jewish, the Jews who were imprisoned in uh, Auschwitz work. And after quite some years after the war, Norbert decided to sue IG Farben for back pay for himself and the fellow Jewish prisoners. And he actually won on his and their behalf in 1950. And I should say that the university he attended in Frankfurt, there were students who had read of Norbert's life and his endeavors and they banded together and really, first of all, managed to have a Norbert Walheim Memorial established at the university, which is the Holocaust Study Center, and also have the street in front of the university named uh, in honor of Nobet. He came, he and his family came to the United, oh, by the way, uh, because he spoke English, uh, he was in the British zone of occupation in Germany and he and another survivor were the emissaries between the survivors in the British zone and the British army of occupation. He came to the United States in 1951 and he, he and I met again in New York. Uh, I, I came back to New York reluctantly, must, I must say after we married in 1981. I, I did not like living in New York. When I was a child, I came home from school and there was a lot of commotion in the building where we lived. And I asked the elevator man what was going on. And he told me that the lady in the apartment next to ours had died and they were in the process of removing the body. And I thought to myself, I never want to live somewhere where you, you were so removed from knowing your neighbor that she can die and that's how you find out about it. So I, very happily had left New York with Henry when we were first married. But life takes some circuitous roads and here I was back in New York. The great thing about being back in New York other than a happy marriage with Norbert was that I had occasion to meet a heroine in my eyes named Vladimir, 
and her husband, Benjamin Vlatka, was a Polish Jew who spoke Polish without an accent and did not look Jewish. When her family was taken to the Warsaw Ghetto, because she did not look Jewish and because she spoke a perfect Polish, she was a courier and was able to get out of the, get in and out of the ghetto, saved some lives of children and also was able to smuggle some very scarce and few guns into the ghetto. She was just an incredible woman. Uh, she and uh, Ben married uh, af af right after the war and then went to South America where he had family. And after some years, and they did very well financially in South America, they came to the United States and Ben was one of the founders of the American Gathering of Jewish Holocaust Survivors, an organization in New York of which he was president for many years. It was Vlatka's goal, which he achieved to have a program for American secondary school teachers who either taught social studies or English and could incorporate the study of the Holocaust into their curricula. I started working as her assistant in 1988. I should say that her program had started the year before and Norbert was in the reunion of the participants, which took place at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. Norbert was the speaker, so I was there and I was just blown away by the sense of camaraderie, commitment and devotion to Vlatka and she was a force of nature. So uh, when I got back to New York, I sent her a letter of appreciation. It was really a fan letter. And in it, I said that uh, it was my belief that if there's any hope for the world, it's through education. And if there was ever anything I could do for her within this program, I would be honored if she called on me. Well, she did. And that's from then on, I traveled. I worked for Vlatka in the city three days a week and traveled with her and the teachers each year, first to Poland, where we visited Auschwitz, Birkenau and Treblinka. And then on to, um, Israel to study first at Yad Vashem, primarily listening to lectures and also hearing some testimonies and then to a kibbutz in Northern Israel, which was founded by survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto. And there we again heard testimony and primarily our time there was spent, the teacher's time was spent there in workshops to formulate methods for teaching the Holocaust successfully. I did that, uh, Novot, after Nova died, uh, I stayed in New York a while longer, but a absolute dream of mine came to fruition when my youngest son, Jeff, married Vicky and they had two fabulous children. It 
became increasingly painful for me to be in New York and have my grandchildren in Seattle. So I moved here. Uh, these are my grandchildren, Hava and Levi. And here is my son, Peter and Jeffrey and my daughter-in-law, Vicki. This is my closest, dearest friend, Barbara. And here are my three nephews and their wives, some with children in Estes Park, Colorado. Well, Charlotte, it's been a really long life. Charlotte, thank you so much for all of your words and your lifelong commitment to education about the Holocaust is so inspiring to me. Um, and I'm sure many folks listening. So we just have a few more minutes and there are some questions that have come in. So I'd love to pose a few of them to you um, from our almost 200 audience members. Um, a few questions about other members of your family, um, including your grandparents, your relative, the lawyer who had been practicing in Spain and then France, did, did those individuals survive the war? And they, uh, my aunt and uncle and my two nephews, my two cousins rather, uh, tried to find a way to come to America. They could not, so they emigrated to Chile. And my uncle said that he had enough of being a lawyer and instead opened a, together with a partner, a uh, haberdashery store, the first one in Concepcion that extended credit to its mm. customers. And they were very successful uh, there. As soon as their oldest son uh, reached maturity of some sort, he was quite the uh, Beau Brummel. So they sent him to high school in Israel. And later on, the rest of the family emigrated to Israel as well. Thank you. A question came in from um, Anonymous about the question of German citizenship. This person says their deceased father had a story very similar to yours and the questioner and their children have been able to reinstate German citizenship. Has, is that something right. that you've done or are interested in or have any of your family members done so? Those of us who were born in Germany and had our German citizenship revoked automatically were reinstated and our children and grandchildren are eligible to apply for German citizenship. And as a matter of fact, my uh, one of my nephews and some of his children have done that. And one of his daughters applied, got German citizenship as well as her American citizenship and spent some years uh, working in Germany. Mm. And you've been back, right, to visit? Yes, but not as a citizen, strictly as a uh, guest. Yes, I've been back a number of times. Uh, the Aschaffenburg, the town I was born in, every five years has a reunion where they invite former citizens of the town. And I, I've been really impressed with the mayor and with the efforts, ongoing efforts to make sure that that sad history is not forgotten. 
Okay. Um, a quick question from Jeremy, who's joining us from Toronto, um, about were your lessons in school in German, Yiddish, Hebrew? German. I, I don't speak Yiddish. It's a fabulous language, which unfortunately I don't have. I, I never mastered. Mm. All right, we'll just do one or two more questions here. Thanks to all who are entering them. And I apologize if we can't get to each one. Um, Gary is asking if you've dealt with um, any amount of survivor's guilt in your life post Holocaust era. I must honestly say that it, that's one affliction that I've never suffered from. That's, that's really good. That's good to hear. So let's finish with a question that came in from a few different people um, regarding any advice you have for preventing something like the Holocaust from occurring. Uh, it's a big question, but if you have any thoughts on what, what we can do. My only advice, such as it is, uh, I think it's imperative to try and stay as informed as you can, vote, vote intelligently, and do what you can within your means to share your stories and try to make life as pleasant for yourself and those within your circle as you possibly can. I, I don't have any answers to the world's problems, I'm afraid. <laughs> but your um your emphasis and your interest in being kind and staying informed, I think are, are really valuable. Education. Yeah. Uh, I would like to add that my, both my grandchildren went to a small private school uh, here in Seattle. And I started volunteering there when Levi started school there. And whereas both Hava and Levi have graduated, I have not. I'm still volunteering there. And it is the most joyful way to start my day that I can imagine. That's so lovely. And you're still doing it on Zoom, I know. Yes, imagine I that, a 92 year old on Zoom. <laughs> we so appreciate you being here. Well, Charlotte, thank you again. And thanks to our audience members. Um, thanks for tuning in to our Lunch and Learns on a weekly basis. I wanna also thank Michelle Quinones for providing our closed captioning today. And I just want to express my support to Richard Green, um, our museum and technology director for assisting us behind the scenes Thanks also to the entire Holocaust Center staff, our executive director, Dee Simon, Alana Cohn Kennedy, Nicole Bella, Lori Warshall Cohen, Amanda Davis, Paul Regelbrug, Rosa Campos, Sydney Dreitel, Ellie Seleski, Rick Brewer, Morgan Romero, and Katie Lawrence. Next week, we will not be hosting a Tuesday Lunch and Learn as usual. Instead, please join us on Zoom on Wednesday, January 27th at 6 p.m. Pacific time for a special program commemorating International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Ted Rosenthal, composer and pianist, will perform excerpts from his jazz opera, Dear Eric, along with Seattle area opera singers, Megan Parker and Robert McPherson. This event is free. There's also a patron level with a $180 donation, and you can visit our website to learn more and register. The views, information, or opinions expressed in today's program 
are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the Holocaust Center or humanity. This program has been recorded and you can find it on our website starting tomorrow. I'd like to again, thank Charlotte Wolheim so much and to all of you for joining us. Stay safe and well, this concludes our program today. <laughs>